Seward's Folly. It's something you'll find in any U.S. history textbook. The belief that the United States' purchase of Alaska from Russia was considered a huge mistake at the time, with the U.S. paying $7.2 million, or the equivalent of over $150 million today, for a whole lot of empty nothingness. It seemed like a lot of folly on a monumental scale. That is, until Alaska was found to be a natural wonderland teeming with natural resources. But if no one knew how valuable Alaska would be, why did the United States purchase it for such a high price? And did people at the time really think it was such a colossal blunder? Today, we're looking at the real reason why the U.S. bought Alaska from Russia. It's hard to imagine the United States today without Alaska as its ultimate, often deadly frontier. At 665,384 square miles, or 1,723,337 square kilometers in size, Alaska is by far the biggest state in the country, making up 16% of all land area in the U.S. The next three biggest states combined, Texas, California, and Montana, are still smaller than it. Its 732,000 residents also make it the third least populous state, with only Wyoming and Vermont having fewer people. It's not only the westernmost state, it's also technically the easternmost, as the Aleutian Archipelago extends so far west, it actually reaches into the eastern hemisphere. And yes, there is even a place you can see Russia from your backyard on a clear day, if you live in a very particular area along the Bering Strait, that is. Since its colonization by Russia in the 1740s, Alaska has been a tantalizing frontier for fortune seekers. Its history is marked by a series of booms and crazes as outsiders rushed in to take advantage of the state's natural resources, and many really did strike it rich by taking its gold, its furs, and more recently, its oil. But it's also home to indigenous cultures who have been adapting to this way of life for thousands of years. Indigenous groups became experts at navigating this forbidding landscape via snowshoes, dog sleds, kayaks, and canoes, and could thrive in harsh conditions. Today, 15% of Alaska's population identifies as indigenous, the most of any U.S. state. Alaska faces Russia across the Bering Strait, with only 55 miles separating the two at the narrowest point. It is largely believed that during the last ice age, Alaska and Eurasia were connected by land, what's called the Bering Land Bridge, or sometimes Beringia. This land bridge served as an entry point for groups of ancient hunter-gatherers to cross over to the Americas and populate the empty land. They would spread far and wide, with some moving south and becoming the ancestors of American Indians. During the last ice age, so much of Earth's water was frozen into glaciers that sea levels dropped worldwide by as much as 300 feet, or 91 meters, exposing land that now lies underwater and connecting places that are separated today. Australia was connected to New Guinea, while Britain and Ireland were connected to mainland Europe via an area known as Doggerland. And parts of Indonesia were connected to mainland Asia. The last ice age lasted from 125,000 to only 14,000 years ago, which is actually a huge chunk of the total time Homo sapiens have even been on the Earth. The ice sheets reached their greatest extent, and sea levels reached their lowest point during a period called the Last Glacial Maximum, about 30,000 years ago. Then, about 15,000 years ago, the Earth started warming up again. Glaciers began melting, sea levels rose, and the Bering Land Bridge went totally underwater about 10,000 years ago. So what was Beringia like? Well, warmer and wetter than you might think, considering this is Alaska in an ice age. It was a refuge for animals like the woolly rhino and the North American camel. Its plant and animal life were more like Eurasia than North America because it was cut off from North America by the massive Laurentide ice sheet. Scientists believe it wasn't until about 20,000 years ago that a corridor opened in the Laurentide ice sheet, allowing people to migrate into the rest of the Americas. However, these numbers are constantly changing as new archaeological remains are found. Alaska was first colonized by Russians beginning in the 18th century but it had been a long trip from Moscow to Asia's Pacific coast in the first place. Russian expansion into Asia began in earnest in the 1600s. These early Russian explorers called Pramashaliniki, meaning your orphan, were merchants and fur trappers who helped Russia expand eastward across Eurasia, seeking pelts, particularly sable. 
they could sell in Europe and China. As these Russians met the nomadic people of Central Asia and Siberia, they would sometimes trade with them for furs, but often they would simply demand tribute or take hostages, demanding furs and pelts be paid as a ransom, in a pattern that would be repeated with the natives of Alaska. In Russia, the Proshliniki were sometimes identified with the Cossacks, semi-nomadic people from the Carpathian Mountains. These frontiersmen were allowed a great deal of autonomy in return for providing military service when called upon. Indeed, there would be little oversight in such a vast and forbidding environment. A common saying went, God is in his heaven and the Tsar is far away. The Russian march across Eurasia was slow and arduous. They established ostrogs, or trading posts, where trade could be conducted and agents could levy a 10% tax. But expansion accelerated under Tsar Peter the Great, who was determined to bring Russia up to speed with the great European powers of the day finally reaching eastern Siberia in the 1690s. As much as the economic benefits of an empire, Russia wanted the prestige of colonies that they saw in the great powers of Western Europe. And what better place to look than to the east? Having expanded across Eurasia, it only made sense for the Russians that they should have a go at the Americas, where other European powers had found such success. Sailing for the Russians, a Danish captain named Vitus Bering explored Alaska's coast in 1728, but it wasn't until 1741 that Bering returned to make landfall. His ship, the St. Gabriel, landed off the coast of Alaska on a small island now named for him. But he wouldn't have much time to celebrate his new island since soon after landing, Captain Bering and much of his crew died of scurvy and a host of other health problems. But the survivors of Bering's expedition brought back some 800 otter pelts to Russia, which soon became more valuable than sable. The Aleutian Islands are surprisingly mild and the seas surrounding them teemed with life, and fortune hunters soon began to pour across the Bering Sea and into the Aleutian Islands in search of pelts. The natives of the Aleutian Islands, called the Aleuts, depended on the sea for food. They had invented the kayak and were skilled hunters of otters and seals. The name Alaska is actually thought to come from the Aleut language. But like so many indigenous people of the Americas, the Aleuts were unprepared for European disease. It is estimated that 80% of the Aleutian people died in the first generations of Russian colonization, from 10,000 in 1741 to only 2,000 by 1800. The Russians saw that the Aleuts were expert hunters, and they continued the pattern established in Siberia, holding natives hostage in return for ransoms paid in furs and pelts. The Russians demanded hunting far beyond what the environment could sustain, which devastated these animals' populations. When the Russians did offer goods and trade, it was liquor and firearms, in addition to the measles and smallpox that they had already given, free of charge. A merchant named Grigory Shilikov saw the potential for a trading company similar to the British East India Company. In 1784, the newly founded Russian American Company established its first permanent settlement on Kodiak Island. Eventually, the Russian American Company, or RAC, was granted a monopoly on all hunting, trading, and mining in the area. In the 1790s, the RAC ended the system of hostage taking, replacing it with something that really wasn't any better. Instead of being taken as hostages, all Aleutian men aged 18 to 50 were conscripted to become hunters for the RAC, whose officials were encouraged to marry indigenous women, spawning a significant Creole population with a foot in both worlds. But Russian America would not be confined to the Aleutian Islands. They established a base on the mainland in 1799, calling it the Fort of Archangel Michael, on what we would call today Alaska's Panhandle. A few years later, the fort was attacked by warriors of Tlingit, whose decorative arts, including totem poles, are immediately recognizable as icons of the American Northwest, and the RAC was forced to pay a ransom for the survivors. The Tlingit held Fort Archangel for more than a year before a fleet arrived from the Russian motherland that bombarded the Tlingit into submission. And today, this is known as the Battle of Sitka, after the indigenous name for the area. Sitka became the capital of Russian America, with its own cathedral and bishop of the Russian Orthodox Church. The RAC dreamed of making the Pacific into a Russian lake. With so much autonomy, its leaders tried setting up outposts in Northern California and even the Sandwich Islands, 
better known today as Hawaii. But the Russian success in Alaska attracted competition almost immediately. The Spanish were defensive of any other settlements on the Pacific coast. Partly in response to Russian Alaska, the Spanish started expanding northward, founding missions in San Diego in 1769, Monterey in 1770, and San Francisco in 1776. The Spanish also made some expeditions to Alaska, establishing a port at Valdez, which would become famous much later in 1989 as the namesake of the supertanker which spilled over 10 million gallons of oil into Alaska's Prince William Sound. Although Russia claimed nearly the entire modern state of Alaska, it penetrated very little into the interior. At the time of Alaska's sail to the United States, only 1,000 Russians were living in the territory, plus another 2,000 people identified as Creoles. Since they never reached much further inland, the Russians had little contact with another of Alaska's native people, the Athabascans, hunters of moose and caribou. Following the herds across Alaska's vast interior, the Athabascans were the most migratory of Alaska's natives. But it was another group that Alaska would come to be most strongly identified with, originally called Eskimos but now referred to by their preferred name of Inuit. They are actually relative newcomers to Alaska, settling in the area only about 1,000 years ago, but today span the Arctic from Siberia to Greenland, and in Alaska, they are divided into the Inupiat in the north and the Yupik in the south. Far from Moscow, Russian America received a supply ship from the motherland only once every two or three years. The colony quickly became dependent on trade and other European settlers, particularly Americans who saw the potential riches swimming off Alaska's shores. Merchants in Boston and New York started sending expeditions to Alaska to acquire otter furs, which they would later take to Canton, the great Chinese trading post of the day. Soon, the merchants were conducting a kind of triangular trade between New England, Alaska, and China. New England merchants were particularly interested in whaling, bringing back whale oil and baleen for various Victorian household goods, including using the oil for lamps and weaving the baleen into baskets and fishing lines. The hunting of whales became more efficient with the invention of the harpoon gun in the 1860s, although it was tempered by the use of petroleum in oil lamps starting in 1859. This use of American merchants as an entry to the Chinese markets was crucial to the RAC because Russian merchants were banned from Chinese ports who saw no need to enrich their great neighbor to the north. But while the colonists in Alaska were relying heavily on American supplies, officials were concerned about Americans supplying natives with firearms and ammunition, and Moscow asked the U.S. to ban the practice, but the federal government declined to intervene. In 1824, the U.S. and Russia hashed out their differences with a treaty that placed the southern boundary of Russia-Alaska at 54 degrees latitude and allowed both nations to trade with the natives alcohol and firearms accepted. Borders remained ill-defined for much of the 19th century, and even the border between Canada and New England was settled only in 1842. But the balance of power was rapidly shifting towards the Americans. In 1844, the U.S. signed its first commercial treaty with China. They would follow suit with Japan in 1858. But more than anything, it was the Mexican-American War and its resulting territorial gains that demonstrated America's hunger for expansion and its commitment to fulfilling the promise of the Monroe Doctrine to let no European power continue operating in North America. But whatever rivalry that may have been felt between Russia and the United States, it paled in comparison to their mutual distrust of Great Britain. Tsar Nicholas I underscored this shared apprehension in a statement to the U.S. minister in St. Petersburg, declaring, Not only are our interests alike, but our enemies are the same. 1853 saw the outbreak of the Crimean War, in which Great Britain and France teamed up to defend the Ottoman Empire after a Russian invasion. It was a decisive defeat for Russia, and one that demonstrated that the country still lagged behind the great powers it was trying to emulate. Particularly weak were the Russian soldiers themselves, many of whom were malnourished serfs in poor physical condition. In the midst of the Crimean War, Tsar Alexander II ascended to the Russian throne in 1855. He would ultimately become a transformative figure in the country's history, known for his extensive liberal reforms. 
Among his most significant achievements was the emancipation of serfs in Russia, a monumental decree that abolished the oppressive system of serfdom in 1861. Following its defeat in the Crimean War, which concluded in 1856, Russia was compelled to redirect its attention toward Europe. Its previous endeavors in North America had yielded minimal economic benefits, with diminishing returns on investments in the region. One stark example of this decline was the precipitous decrease in the sea otter population. It is estimated that in the early 19th century, approximately 300,000 sea otters inhabited the coastal waters of the North Pacific. However, by the mid-1800s, their numbers had plummeted to a mere few thousand due to overhunting. Consequently, Russia's diminished prospects in North America prompted a strategic realignment, emphasizing the need for engagement and diplomacy within the European sphere. Alexander II relied heavily on his advisors, particularly his brother, Grand Duke Constantine. Through the press, Constantine criticized the Russian-American company as economically unsound and drew comparisons between Alaska's natives and Russia's beleaguered serfs. Alexander's advisors started toying with the idea of selling Alaska. Faced with the potential of losing Alaska without any recompense, the idea of selling the territory appeared increasingly attractive. Despite the recent discovery of modest gold deposits in Alaska, Russian authorities were not swayed to maintain their hold on the region. In fact, they were acutely aware of the fervor that had accompanied the California gold rush in the 1840s and 1850s, which saw the arrival of more than 300,000 prospectors from across the globe and were concerned that a similar influx of foreign gold seekers in Alaska could ultimately lead to the loss of their territory without any financial gain. It seemed like an easy choice to make, sell Alaska or lose it. But who should be the buyer? The U.S. was an obvious choice to offer Alaska to. However, the ongoing civil war left the nation financially strained and reluctant to incur additional expenses. More than anything, Russia did not want Alaska to be absorbed into British Canada, as Britain was Russia's chief rival at the time. But then again, Britain was basically everyone's chief rival then. Chaos in the United States stoked Canadian movements for confederation, which would mean self-rule while remaining under the protection of Great Britain. In 1866, a group of citizens in British Columbia voted to request permission from the British government to join the United States but the movement never progressed any further than that. That same year, the U.S. House of Representatives introduced an annexation bill that was never voted on. The United States' expansionist attitude ultimately propelled the Canadian provinces toward confederation, and in March 1867, Queen Victoria gave her assent to the creation of the Dominion of Canada, which remained under British control, but possessed a significantly enhanced capacity for self-governance. In late 1866, a few months before the creation of the Dominion of Canada, Tsar Alexander received a report recommending the sale of Alaska to the United States. Alexander instructed his minister, Edward Stokel, to gauge the Americans' interest in the purchase. Stokel, who had served as Russia's representative in the U.S. since 1854, was well-connected in Washington, D.C., and had been an early advocate for selling Alaska to the U.S., when it came to negotiating, Stokel had a more than willing partner in the U.S. Secretary of State, William Seward. Seward, a former governor of New York, was a prominent abolitionist and supporter of the U.S.'s territorial expansion. Seward was the model of a 19th century politician given to long, off-the-cuff speeches and equally comfortable on the campaign trail as in smoky back rooms. He saw no contradiction between his support for emancipation and his desire that the United States expand across the continent into Indian country. Annexation of Canada seemed to always be on Seward's mind, saying in 1853 that Canada, although a province of Great Britain, is already half annexed to the United States. In 1860, Seward sought the Republican nomination for president, and on the campaign trail, he made specific references to Alaska saying, I see the Russian, and I can say, go on and build up your outposts all along the coast, up even to the Arctic Ocean. They will yet become the outposts of my own country. 
After losing the 1860 nomination, Seward joined Abraham Lincoln's cabinet, which would later be called the Team of Rivals, for the sharply divergent views of its members. During the Civil War, he warned the British envoy against recognizing the Confederacy, threatening to declare a war on Great Britain that would lead to an invasion of Canada. After Lincoln's assassination, Seward remained Secretary of State under President Andrew Johnson, an uncomfortable arrangement for all of Lincoln's cabinet. A former slave owner, Johnson was widely seen as overly conciliatory towards the South, and negotiating the sale of Alaska gave Seward something to do outside the contentious politics of Reconstruction. On March 9, 1867, Stokel and Seward met in Washington. Stokel was under orders only to bring up the idea of selling Alaska after Seward had broached the subject. The two men talked a while about fishing rights until finally, Seward brought up the subject of the United States purchasing Alaska, at which point Stokel revealed that the Tsar had authorized him to negotiate just such a sale. The next day, with President Johnson's approval, negotiations began. Five days later, Seward and Stokel met again. Seward insisted that any sale be kept secret until it was completed and opened with an offer of $5 million. Stokel immediately sent the Tsar a cable pledging to secure a higher price of $6 million to $6.5 million. At the next cabinet meeting, Seward presented a draft treaty offering the Russians $7 million, evidently expecting Stokel to be a skilled negotiator. With only minor objections, the cabinet unanimously approved the motion. In a subsequent meeting, Seward and Stokel ironed out more specifics including the Russian-American company's remaining assets. Stokel managed to raise the sale price to $6.5 million, and after agreeing to include the RAC's buildings in the sale, the final price was set at $7 million, payable 10 months after the treaty signing. At the last moment, the price was raised from $7 million to $7.2 million, an addendum that would become a point of contention when the sale went before Congress for appropriation. The agreement also stipulated that the U.S. would not be burdened by prior obligations effectively dissolving the Russian-American company. For $7.2 million, Seward had acquired 140 million acres for the United States, amounting to a mere two cents per acre. From the perspective of the American people, the sale seemed to materialize overnight. There had been talk of buying Alaska before, but nothing to suggest such a deal was imminent. In the popular imagination of American history, the purchase of Alaska was derided in its day as Seward's folly, a monumental blunder whose wisdom became apparent only decades later. But this vision of history is not borne out when you review the newspapers of the day. The New York Times called it an important annexation that the American people hailed with delight. Other papers gleefully speculated that annexation of Canada was sure to follow. The New York Herald urged Britain to withdraw gracefully from a continent where its institutions are out of place, adding that its continued presence in North America can only bring trouble upon her colonies and humiliation to her government. Seward may have paid for some of his favorable press, a common practice at the time, and one which Seward, as a New Yorker, was particularly well-placed to cultivate. On the flip side, the Farmer's Cabinet, which was published in Philadelphia, described Alaska as hardly worth accepting as a gift. Others who opposed the sale at the time included Horace Greeley of the New York Tribune. Ironically, Greeley had coined the famous phrase, Go West, young man. But perhaps he didn't mean that far west. He evidently saw the purchase of Alaska as irresponsible given the U.S.'s financial straits of the post-war years. But it appears that most Americans welcomed the acquisition of Alaska. They saw it as a deposit for mineral resources and a destination for restless pioneers. More than anything, though, Americans welcomed the acquisition of Alaska as a crucial step on the way toward annexing Canada. After all, they had been told it was their destiny, and their destiny was manifest. One scholar wrote that the idea of the purchase of Alaska being greeted as a folly is one of the strongest historical myths in American history. It persists despite conclusive evidence to the contrary and the efforts of the best historians to dispel it. Still, the myth of Seward's folly took root because it bolstered the self-image of Alaska as a territory of renegades, 
misfits, and pioneers who only wanted it for the quick riches lurking beneath the ice. While the American people have enthusiastically greeted news of the purchase, Congress was less enthused, irritated that they had not been consulted. Congress could not object to the Secretary of State making agreements with foreign countries. That was his job, after all. But what they could object to was the appropriation of funds, which they were supposed to control. Although the $7.2 million price was relatively modest, the colony, separated from the rest of the country by Canada, had the potential to become financially burdensome to administer. But there was no way to go back on the deal without serious damage to the country's credibility. Furthermore, the American people had been told Alaska was now theirs, and Congress was reluctant to deprive the citizens of their newfound frontier. Russia watched nervously as Congress debated the appropriations bill. If the bill failed, the Tsar considered outright gifting the territory to the U.S., but worried about the terrible precedent that would set. Stokel, with his ear to the ground in Washington, dissuaded Johnson and Seward from intervening, sensing that both men were so unpopular in Congress that they could only do more harm than good. Stokel complained of the difficulty of getting anything done in the U.S. as compared to the monarchies of Europe saying that in the U.S., it is necessary to confer with some hundreds of individuals to know almost all of them. Almost as soon as the sale was announced, Americans began swarming the new territory. Settlers staked claims, believing they would become legitimated when the territory's transfer to U.S. control was formalized. Russia agreed that the U.S. would immediately set up customs stations to levy imports from foreign nations. Some Russian citizens remained in Alaska after the handover, but nearly all of them soon returned to Russia, disturbed by the lawlessness that accompanied the American occupation. The official transfer of power took place on October 18, 1867, a little after 3 o'clock in the afternoon, in a ceremony attended by about 300 people. There were no speeches, only a volley of firearm salutes exchanged by Russian and American soldiers. During the flag lowering, the Russian flag got tangled up in ropes, and to the horror of many, an American soldier used his bayonet to forcibly rip the Russian flag down from its position. After the flags were exchanged, the Russian commissioner said simply, by authority from His Majesty the Emperor of Russia, I transfer to the United States the territory of Alaska. With Alaska formally in American hands, Congress could do little but debate the wisdom of the purchase. To refuse appropriation would cause massive logistical problems and damage the ability of the U.S. to act on the world stage. Still, holdouts wondered how the U.S. could justify spending so much money on uncharted territory while it struggled to pay benefits to Civil War veterans and their families. In July 1868, the House of Representatives authorized the funds to pay the Alaska Purchase, 113 to 43. In August, the U.S. transferred the money to Russia via London. The payment was technically three months late, but no one seemed to mind. That is, until 1869, when the primary architects of the deal, Seward and Stokel, were both out of office. The new Russian minister, Konstantin Karakasi, sent a bill for the three months' accumulated interest to Hamilton Fish, the new Secretary of State, totaling $155,200. It does not appear that Katakasi had been instructed to seek this late payment. The request was ignored, and it contributed to the new Russian minister's reputation as an abrasive fortune seeker. After Congress approved the sale, accusations arose of malfeasance. Banker George Riggs testified that Stokel had told him to wire just a little over $7 million to London, leaving $165,000 in the United States. The balance seems to have been distributed to various journalists who had written articles supporting the deal. There were also reports that Seward had bragged about the various palms he had greased to help the deal happen. Still, bribing newspapermen for favorable coverage was a common enough practice that there was little backlash. Now, formally in American hands, Alaska was placed under the Navy's control, led by Major General Henry Halleck. Halleck put in charge one Jefferson C. Davis, unrelated to the President of the Confederacy, but infamous all his own. In 1862, Davis had killed a fellow Major General, William Nelson, unrelated to the country music legend, over a perceived insult. Now, Davis was put in charge of Alaska, 
with instruction to be particularly wary of the indigenous Tlingit. Described as warlike and treacherous, Halleck recommended that Davis have guns charged with grape and canister always bearing on their village, ready at an instant's warning to destroy them. For six months, Davis and his family shared the governor's house with Prince Maskatov, the outgoing head of the Russian-American company. If Maskatov shared any insight on maintaining peaceful relationship with the natives, Davis did not heed them. Instead, Davis's tenure was marked by bloody confrontations, kidnapping tribal leaders, and holding them hostage, as well as wholesale massacring of villages. Natives protested the sale of Alaska as illegitimate, but without courts of law to grant them standing, native Alaskans had little recourse with which to register their discontent. In July 1869, William Seward made his first visit to the territory and worked to incorporate. He was shocked by the state of the natives, noting with regret that a people so vigorous and energetic, so docile and gentle, can neither be preserved as a distinct social community nor be incorporated into our society. Alaska attracted an itinerant population of fortune seekers who were prone to vices, including drinking, gambling, and violence. The largely male population attracted prostitutes whose cabins became integral to the developing towns. At the same time, a growing temperance movement took root. But like national prohibition in the 20th century, prohibition in Alaska only gave rise to smuggling and dangerously unregulated homemade alcohol called hooch. In 1880, the first census of Alaska was undertaken, an ambitious goal given its size and forbidding climate. The census showed a population of 33,000, all but 430 of them indigenous. 1880 also saw the first of many gold strikes by French-Canadian prospectors, one of them named Joe Juneau. In a pattern that would be repeated, the city of Juneau quickly ballooned as gold hunters swarmed the area. Nome followed in 1889, and Fairbanks in 1902. The population of Alaska doubled from 1890 to 1900, from around 30,000 to more than 60,000. In 1896, rich gold deposits were found in Rabbit Creek, a tributary of the Klondike River in the Canadian Yukon. Eventually, more than $300 million worth of gold would be extracted from the Klondike. In 1912, Alaska officially became a territory with its own legislature. There, women gained the right to vote eight years before the 19th Amendment was passed. 1915 saw the founding of Anchorage, described as the softest birth of any city on record, supported by federal money and a ban on gambling, saloons, and prostitution. Alaska played an important role in World War II as a place to mobilize troops before deployment into the Pacific Theater. But it was not until 1959 that Alaska finally became the country's 49th state, and first new one since Arizona, 47 years earlier. Alaska became an important geopolitical location during the Cold War, given its proximity to Russia, with military bases in Anchorage and Fairbanks. In 1971, President Richard Nixon ceded 44 million acres of federal land to Alaska's indigenous populations, along with a $1 billion grant and today, more than half of Alaska remains federally owned. The sale has loomed in the Russian imagination as well. During the Soviet era, some teachers taught that Alaska was an example of the hubris of the monarchy, expanding beyond its ability to govern. Other teachers told students that there was no sale at all, that according to a technicality of the treaty, Alaska had merely been leased to the United States for 100 years, similar to Great Britain's century-long lease of Hong Kong. With relations between Russia and the U.S. turning worse in the 2010s, some Russian politicians landed on Alaska as a point of contention, looking for errors in the original treaty language that would nullify the sale, or threatening to seize Alaska in retribution for sanctions levied by the U.S., although even Moscow Times has called these overtures generally facetious. The discovery of oil transformed Alaska just as the discovery of gold had earlier. With the completion of the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, oil money became a significant share of the state's operating budget. 25% of oil revenues are put in an investment account that pretty much bankrolls the state, which has no personal income tax or sales tax. So then, where did the myth that buying Alaska was a mistake come from? 
The idea of Seward's folly may just have been a creation of historians in search of a good underdog story. Perhaps we should call it Seward's Gamble instead, since it was a gamble that has paid off handsomely in gold, oil, and other natural resources. But most importantly for the United States, Alaska remains a symbol of the frontier, a place where the intrepid can find a fortune, if they are tough enough to survive.